Good afternoon and welcome to today's program on other transactions. My name is Jessica Tillotman and I'm the Assistant Dean for Government Procurement Law here at GW Law School. Today's program was designed to provide our students, our alumni and friends of the program with a forum to learn about the history of other transactions, address recent developments, brainstorm research topics and discuss potential future applications of this important procurement tool. But you should also consider it the first of many conversations about OTs that our program plans to host in the future. We are very aware that there is significant interest in this topic, so we have a lot of exciting things planned for you. We are already hard at work planning some programming on other transactions to take place in the fall, and we are very hopeful that within the next year or so, our program will launch an online course dedicated exclusively to the topic of OTs. Now, before I introduce today's esteemed group of speakers, I want to go over the format of today's program. For the first part of the program, our moderator will lead our panelists in a robust discussion about OTs. Once their initial presentation concludes, we would like you to join in the discussion. Throughout the program, please note in the chat or Q&A section of Zoom whether you have a question or comment. Once we get to the discussion section of today's program, you will be unmuted so that you can join in the discussion live. The goal is to have a robust dialogue between our speakers and attendees. So the presumption is that you'll be unmuted to join in the discussion. If you prefer to remain muted and just wanna to stick to the chat or Q&A box, you'll need to make that clear in your comments. Now that everybody knows the ground rules, let's meet our panelists. Today's moderator is GW Law's very own Professor Steve Schooner, the Nash and Sabinic Professor of Government Procurement Law. Our first panelist is Rick Dunn, the founder of the Strategic Institute for Innovation in Government Contracting. Prior to founding the Strategic Institute, Rick was the first general counsel of DARPA. Our second panelist is Hallie Tremaine Balkan, the learning director for other transactions at the Defense Acquisition University. Prior to joining DAU, Hallie worked as an associate counsel for Naval Information Warfare Systems Command Headquarters. I'm going to provide links to the impressive bios of our speakers in the chat box so you can learn more about their backgrounds. I'm also going to provide a list of resources that our speakers have developed on other transactions that we hope will assist you in your research and your work. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Steve. Steve, thank you. So let me echo Jessica in saying thanks so much for joining us. And it's always fascinating to see how vision and reality tend to intersect and diverge in programs like this. As Jessica mentioned, I was very excited to bring our students together with some subject matter experts, but it may in fact have morphed to something else. And that's probably a good thing as well there. But it's always exciting to be talking about other transactions and more broadly, let's be honest, what we're really talking about is innovation. So I hope it's worth your time. I am confident that if you stick with us and if you pay attention to the chat log, if nothing else, we'll give you opportunities and access to lots and lots of information. We'll be dropping some links into the chat log as Jessica mentioned. But because we're at GW, I always have to start with a small piece of, re of history. And as some of you know, Paul Dembling was an alum of the law school. Paul Demling was a fascinating guy, the only person to ever be the general counsel of both the GAO and NASA. And again, I think we'll drop the link in just a moment, but at the 50th anniversary of NASA, in a fascinating interview, Paul Demling was asked the following question. He, he was asked, you're proud that the Space Act gave NASA authority to perform contracts, leases, cooperative agreements, and other transactions as may be necessary. Can you explain the significance of the term other transactions? Well, you can see the interview because we'll give you the link in just a moment. But basically what Paul said is he made something up so that he could operate or that NASA could operate outside of the conventional procurement system. And frankly, we've come a long way since then. Now, other transactions, for at one point we called them other transactions authority, but OTs have been part of the discussion for a long time now. NASA, the other agencies, more and more, but frankly, they just haven't been statistically significant. And frankly, until very, very recently, 
OTs accounted for less than 1% of all procurement dollars. Now, look, that doesn't tell the whole story because as we know that early program money is often spent in smaller increments and the bigger money is spent in full production or implementation. But the thing that I want you to focus on is the reality is, and this is somewhat recent, but that game has changed. So let me just, and again, we're not gonna use a lot of slides today. I just want you to focus on the numbers for one moment. Until less than two years ago, we had never spent 1% of federal procurement dollars on other transactions. But look at the growth curve in the last couple of years. So 2.5% of federal procurement was spent through OTs in fiscal year 2020. That may not seem like a lot, but the steepness, the angle of that curve cannot be ignored. So the reality is, is after a lot of years of talking about it, it looks like we're finally start getting some action with regard to OTs. Now, there's a wealth of literature out there. For many of our students, the Department of Defense OT guide has been a kind of Bible of sorts and that's evolved. But the elephant in the room and the thing that I really appreciated in the most, version of, most recent version of the OT guide was the emphasis on the fact that OTs are contracts, but they're not FAR-based contracts. What that means in and of itself could easily fill this session, but that's not what we're gonna do. Now what I'd like to do is start getting our panelists involved. And I'm gonna start with Rick. And for those of you who haven't been reading Rick on OTs for a lot of years, you should. We'll give you some more resources there. But let's start with this. In the most recent piece that you posted, you talked about the agreement officer conundrum. Tell us what you mean when you're talking about that conundrum. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Steve. As with many things, there's a problem and the problem starts with leadership. And leadership, uh, some of the top people in the Department of Defense and in other agencies talk about OTs and they talk about them in a favorable light without understanding the true potential of, of OTs. They are contracts, as you just said, and they're not limited to contracts that establish a buyer-seller relationship, which is what the federal acquisition regulation is all about. It's a purchasing system and it, and it has a one-dimensional relationship, buyer and seller memorialized in part one of the FAR. OTs are not subject to that limitation. They can be contracts of a wide variety of different kinds. They can be multi-party agreements. The funding can flow in either direction uh, under an OT uh, and they're very flexible instruments. So the problem in the OT, the generally excellent DOD OT guide, it says that an agreements officer does not have to be a warranted contracting officer. The language that it uses all, almost um, points in that direction. And the way it's actually been implemented is that most agreements officers are in fact warranted FAR contracting officers and they work in the environment of a procurement contract office. Expecting uh, a professional to switch from a freedom of contract mode into a highly regulated purchasing system and back and forth as part of his job. And by, by the way, most of these people that are acting as agreements officers ha have not been well schooled in other transactions. The amount of education and training that's available is extremely limited and they, re they revert to their normal uh, FAR practices. So that's the basic conundrum uh, with the agreements office. And, and so, so Hallie, I'm going to do two, I'm going to do something a little bit unfair. I'm actually going to start you with two questions. I love the fact that Rick pointed out that for many in our communities, the CEOs, the 1102s, your conventional contracting officers, were told to innovate and use these new tools, but under Dawia or the Klinger Cohen Act, they were trained on how the FAR works, and now they're being asked to use this other innovative tools. So I'm gonna ask you to say a word about training and how DAU is approaching that. But I also want you to weigh in if you could, and again, do them one at a time, I'll help later if you need. But I love the fact that Rick talked about 
the idea that you've got these new tools, but we have this classic competitive environment. So when we have a world of the far, we have a world on, of other transactions, is that the death of the Competition Contracting Act? Is it the end of SECA? It kind of reminds me of the classic book in first year contract law, Grant Gilmore's The Death of Contract about promissory estoppel. But so those two things, training and that tension between the SECA FAR rubric and OTs as we know them. Yes, all right. So the first question, uh, Rick makes a really good point. I'll admit that when I first learned about OTs and I started contemplating the use of it, I too felt a little bit uncomfortable because when we get so ingrained in this FAR-based world and we have our rule set that's there for us, it's difficult to take off that FAR hat and think differently and think of these vendors as partners and really want to engage in a business completely different. Um, what we're doing at DAU about it is getting people trained. We have developed three different workshops and courses. We are reaching out to folks nationwide now and across the globe, OCONUS, because now we're not constrained by you know, a 20 person class in a certain region because we can utilize this type of medium that we're on right now, virtual meetings, virtual classes. So we're doing our best. And uh, the last couple months, we've trained something like 2,500 students already. So we're on board, we're ready to train, and we're excited to keep bringing the most relevant speakers the re most relevant resources to the workforce. Um, okay, second question, death of... <laughs> so I've heard this before and it's a really interesting point. So just because Competition and Contracting Act doesn't apply to OTs, doesn't mean that we are just picking a vendor with our eyes closed and you know picking whoever we want. We still have to be fair. We still have to be equitable and transparent. And Congress, authorized the use of OTs in a much more broad sense in the last, gosh, is it the 2015 NDAA? And they could take that away from us if we misuse it or we don't use it correctly. So we don't wanna abuse the authority and we wanna be able to keep having the flexibility to reach these vendors in an industrial base otherwise unavailable to us. So I'm actually gonna take a half step back on both of you because one of the things that's interesting is when we talk about curriculum and training, we so frequently begin with, here's the thing I want you to do, and here's the way you do that skill. And particularly when we meet people who are very good at one thing, sometimes they don't always have the big picture. So for example, what we just talked about to some extent is a binary choice between using a FAR-based contract or an OT or something innovative. Not that difference but between in the formation phase, making the decision to use a cost reimbursement contract or a fixed price contract, or having a solicitation choice, IFB versus RFP or whatever. But these are all, to some extent, acquisition planning and market research ideas. So I guess I'd be curious, and I kind of want to go back, I'll start with Rick, but I'm also curious to hear from Hallie on this, but how do you see most officials being brought into this? I could see in many organizations, a group of requirements generators or end users or need generators saying, this is what we need. And the contracting officer saying, okay, I'll start the acquisition uh, planning process. And somebody else saying, well, we, we may not need to do that because we have this newer innovative approach. Part of me seems like once the train starts moving on acquisition planning towards the far, you've already lost your window of opportunity for OT. And if you don't make the decision early enough on the innovative approach, you don't necessarily get the right people in the room. So I, I think I'm asking a number of different questions about planning and getting the right people in the room or the like, but I'd love to hear your observations on that. If you, uh, of course, if you look at the definition of acquisition in the FAR, it's acquisition begins when agency needs are known and requirements described then acquisition begins. If you, if you look at our strategic, if you look at the DOD OT guide, as well as what we teach in uh, strategic institute conferences, that's not the starting point. The starting place is what problem am I trying to solve? Or what's the capability gap? Or what goal is out there that I need to incorporate to 
move down the path to a new capability affor affordably. Um, so it, even, even if a defined requirement ends up on the lap of someone who has uh, contracting authority, the first question should be, let's sit, see if we can deduce what problem this requirement is trying to solve and intellectually go back over the terrain because a lot of requirements have nice to have but not essential elements in them that drive up cost and don't necessarily result it in uh, uh, additional capability that's, uh, that may absolutely be needed. So the, the idea of parsing the problem, and by the way, who parses the problem? Well, a team of people need to par parse the problem. And the key person in that process, not a warranted contracting officer or agreements officer, it's somebody who might have the title program manager, who has a mission to accomplish and a budget to accomplish that mission. Those are um, the people that need to hear what the part of the possible is with other transactions. Those are the people that ought to be knocking on the door of the contracting office and saying, this is what I need for my program. How can you help me? As opposed to saying, oh, I'm going to stuff my program into the FAR uh, paradigm of how, how we do things. So I think that's that's sort of the initial answer is is the the, the front end of the process uh, indeed has to be open. I mean, if, if a simple buyer seller relationship takes care of you and you don't mind the overhead of the FAR, you can go that route. But if you as a program manager or some other official have a vision for your project and you say, I need the best performers, not only do I need the best performers, but I need them in a collaborative uh, relationship. Um, by the way, there's a lot of commercial potential. Maybe I need some resource sharing from uh, industry to show their commitment to, to what we're doing. It's a, it's a whole different train of thinking um, as, as you move forward. And as I said, the guy driving the train ought to be the guy that has a mission to accomplish and not necessarily somebody who's process oriented. I'll add okay. something as well, if I may. I, Rick, I echo everything you state, and I think that the program folks really should be the, the deciding officials of whether or not an OT could best fit their needs based on that market intelligence that is conducted. But I also would be remiss if I didn't give some firsthand experiences with program folks coming into my office when I was a program attorney wanting to utilize OTs because it's the best thing since sliced bread, and it might be something that the government had been acquiring for years on a FAR-based procurement vehicle, and they just wanted something different that they heard could go faster. So it, of course, has to be appropriate for the, for the OTA um, statutes, and we can't just switch something to an OT vehicle because we want to. So I would always explain to my clients that there has to be something novel, new, a new application, a new aspect of the technology, something developed. In a, in a different way to meet that prototype definition. Well, one of the things I really like about this exchange is uh, during a lot of the rewriting of the FAR in the 1990s, some thought was put into this concept of redefining and broadening the definition of the acquisition team. So who's part of a team? And to be fair, there was a fair amount of belief into the 1990s that one of the groups that was underrepresented in the team, or in other words, didn't get into the room until too late were the attorneys. Because the theory was by the time the attorneys got it, they were often presented then a paper contract said, review this with an eye towards yes or no. And the problem was at that point, any changes you made, people were hostile to them because you had been dragged in too late. But I think that the starting point here is so important. It's nice to have a contracting officer talking with a program manager. And wouldn't it be even better if the program manager is in the room with a contracting officer and an agreements officer thinking broadly the first time. But at the end of the day, creatively thinking about the solution means we might need different people. And as, as our students often hear, one of the most frustrating things about government procurement is how weak government officials market research skills are. 
And one of the reasons we so frequently see government officials, I'm just going to do what my predecessor did, or I'm just going to do what I did last time, is because they don't know the market. And the market isn't just who the vendors are, but it's how they do business and vehicles and the like. So I think that getting experienced people into the room is really an important part of this. And in addition, it also brings up some issues about risk aversion, which I'm sure that we're going to come back to as well. All right. And again, we could always come back to any of these issues, but I want to talk a little bit since I mentioned the trend line earlier. I want to go back to you, Rick, and talk a little bit about trends. So I'm curious about a couple of different things. First, if we've had OT since NASA was created, and obviously a number of years ago, they were brought into DOD. Why did it take so long to catch on? And why is it that it seems like sometimes OTs have been used successfully and then they lapse or we take a step forward and a step, step back? Is that that people have been burned? Is it the expertise moves on to other things? Are there other factors? Is it fear? What's your theory on that? Um, part of it relates to the team issue that you were talking about, putting together a capable team and making sure that the team is both empowered with authority and education and also protected from the business as usual bureaucracy. Uh, and, and very little of DOD and some go other government agencies are actually set up that way. Uh, and you talk about the role uh, of the attorney. Of course, at DARPA, I'm, I brought the authority uh, to DARPA uh, by obtaining it from Congress. And then I wrote the first guide uh, and was involved in all the initial agreements. And, and our initial agreements were signed by the director of DARPA. So we had leadership interest and and somebody who re really wanted to do business. And, and by the way, the other point that you made, DAR DARPA program managers are aware of the capabilities that are out there. They're out there beating the bushes and finding- Okay, but, but Rick, I wanna interrupt just for a second. I mean, sure. look, the beauty of this, and one of the reasons that you're in the room is because DARPA is the unicorn, right? Isn't the whole point about DARPA that the people there are not about just do what we did before. We're supposed to do new and creative things. So you have the competitive advantage of, we are the mold breakers. We are the innovators. We're out there on the cutting edge. And now, okay, so maybe that gets me from half a percent to 1% or 2%. But if we wanna talk about spreading the religion or more broadly sharing the experience, how do you culturally move away from, I don't want to call it the crucible or the test bed of DARPA to a big, broad government where you've got lots of more conventional thinkers? So one of the, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the issues when I, when I came from NASA, having been exposed to Space Act, other transactions authority, and along the way, having met Paul Demling and came, came to DARPA, one of the things I wanted to do is N not have other transactions just be exceptional, but have them integrated into how we do business. And they get, when it's appropriate to do them, you do them and people are capable of doing them. My most recent article, the agreements officer conundrum relates to that issue because at DARPA, we had the capable program managers. Well, what do you do if you're in a, an organiza organization where your program manager is a uniformed officer and he's only going to be there for three years and the first year he spends finding his way to the men's room or the ladies room as the case may be uh, and the last year he's planning for his new, new assignment and along the way he hasn't been able to familiar familiarize himself with the technology with the industry and so on and so forth well today we have the opportunity for example for your organization to enter into a partnership intermediary relationship with a nonprofit or educational institution who can go out and beat the bushes, who can be the subject matter experts and find out where the talent is and then help the program man manager in formulating, you know, uh, in understanding what his talent pool is and, uh, and what relationships he ought, ought to be developing. And there are a number of partnership intermediary agreement uh, undertaken by uh, the Department of Defense. But for, the, for those uh, organizations that are weak in that area of outreach and understanding 
uh, where innovation lies. That's one technique uh, that can be can be used to uh, to improve their uh, their prospects. But uh, the the core of your question is, you know, you can't just do this as business as usual. You really have to realize this is something special, and to start off doing it right, you need that empowered team. And and by the way, financial managers might need to be on that team in certain circumstances. Other sub testers, other subject matter experts, depending on the goals of the project and how you want to structure the project. There's no one simple answer here, I think. You get to think through the issues and come up with an optimum solution. So, so I find that incredibly informative. I just want to mention to both you and to Hallie, and I'm not going to put you on the spot in a moment, but maybe we'll come back to this. There's a question in the chat from a participant about, you know, we're talking about procurement for contracts, but the same issues actually can arise in the grant world. And I want to mention for anybody who's on this program, one of the things to me that is one of the least studied and frankly concerning developments of my professional lifetime is historically the federal acquisition regulation before that, the DAR, the ASPR, the FPR, but Federal government contracts are pretty heavily regulated, but grants have been more loosely and less consistently regulated, and they've had significantly less oversight. But I just want you to process for a moment that for 17 of the last 19 years, I'm pretty sure that's right, the federal government has spent more money in grants than in federal government contracts. Less transparency, less staff, less oversight. More money goes out the door every year in grants than procurement, but we don't know as much about that money and all the training that we're familiar with at DAU and FAI and all of these types of programs. There is no similar institution basically making people subject matter experts in the kind of nuanced grant management that we're used to with procurement. So I think this is a really important issue. And if either of you want to comment on that now or later, I think that would be terrific. Um, the other one that I want, in light of what uh, Rick and I were just talking about, I want to go back to Hallie on this issue of the new requirement. So just imagine, and again, help us think through the process. I'm not a DARPA where everybody gets it, okay? And I'm not at an FFRDC that works with DARPA that does this every day and has the menu in front of them. So I'm in a conventional government office. There's a new requirement. Let's say the best case scenario is I've got a CO and an agreements officer in the room or they're the same person. What's the rubric for making the decision whether I'm gonna use a FAR-based procurement or an OT? So there's not one size fits all for that consideration. The specific circumstances of what you need, what problem you need to solve is always going to drive that analysis. And some potential considerations might be a few different kind of aspects. So first of all, is the technology available in the commercial marketplace? Does it already exist or does it need to be developed? Who are the players? Who are the vendors? And we touched on some of that market research, market intelligence. Oftentimes we're seeing government folks conduct this market intelligence and what they find is already obsolete by the time they're ready to press go. So it really is shifting the mindset of how to research, go beyond what's already available out there. Look at social media, go to trade shows or virtually, virtually go to trade shows. Look on LinkedIn, get involved with industry rich areas like Silicon Valley, DC, Austin, where these firms are located. Um, also consider what it's a timeline sought to get this technology. Are you going to be in an obsolete place by the time, you know, six months go by, three months, a year, however long it might take? Um, what are the intellectual property and data rights that you need? How flexible are the vendors out there or inflexible that you're seeking? If they're a big Silicon Valley firm, they might not be willing to give you any kind of IP if it's something that's already been developed but is new to the government, therefore could constitute a prototype. Um, also, Rick kind of mentioned before getting that finance team involved, what kind of funding do you have available? And do you even have someone with the appropriate warrant? Do you have someone with an agreements officer warrant ready to go? Or do you want to look into a consortium? 
So there's all these different kinds of considerations, but the big thing to start off with is, is this a proper prototype or research subject? Could it fit into one of those categories? So, you know, in light of what you said, the, the one thing that the, the bell that's screaming in the back of my head, and I'm going to come back to you first, and then we'll, we'll bring Rick in on this. But the thing that we, we maybe haven't said, and we, I guess, just all assume it, is one of the arguments that I've always heard that's the most compelling for other transactions are the fundamental underlying barriers to entry for FAR-based contracting, and in particular, cost reimbursement FAR-based contracting. So... The moment I say you have to understand the FAR, and in addition to understanding the FAR, you have to have a competent compliance system. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to give you a cost reimbursement contract, and you may have to be under the cost accounting standards. I have altered the gene pool, and I haven't altered it a little bit. I fundamentally changed it. So I guess the question is, is how affirmatively or aggressively are end user requirements generators in thinking that if I come outside the FAR, if I come outside the rubric where you have to have the compliance system and the accounting system, I'm going to get access to different, more creative innovators who wouldn't play. And it's not just that I'm going to get different people who are going to play, but they're only going to be willing to play under different types of arrangements that I'd never get during the FAR. So Hallie, let me know what you think about that. And then I'm going to come back to Rick on that one. Yes, I think it's a total mind shift of looking at these companies, these vendors as a partner. We're not in a simple or complex FAR-based arrangement where we are the awardee, the government, and vendor, you are the, or we are the awarder, you are the awardee. Therefore, you do what we say or you're ineligible or non-compliant. It's shifting that mindset to a partnership. What can we both agree upon? What terms are fair to both of us? Cost accounting system, CAS, that's expensive. There's a reason a lot of folks don't want to play with the government because that takes a lot of money, effort, and resources to comply with those types of cost reimbursement vehicles. So if we're looking for some sort of cost arrangement on an OT vehicle, how do we make it fair for both? I always prefer firm priced OT arrangements with kind of milestones so you can track and pay it as the deliverable is successfully delivered. But if there is a cost aspect or a cost sharing aspect to it or a reimbursement aspect, negotiate in a fair way. It's not just the government dictating the terms because we are going to scare off or intimidate or kind of put off those vendors who are, we need their technology. We need what they, they can offer. So it's really that shift, I think, in mindset to see them as a true partner in a sense that it needs to be equitable and fair in order to be attractive to them as well in the same way that they're attractive to us. Sorry, I was muted. Just before you leave that, I don't know if you noticed, but a question just popped up in the box about, are you making a binary distinction between only non-traditional companies or also OTs for the regular players? So does this alter the competition equation or not? I think it really depends on the traditional player. Sometimes these traditional players, even though they're well-versed in government business, might have a product line that they're not willing to put onto a FAR construct, or maybe they're seeing the shift in US dollars, government dollars spent, that they, they wanna have more flexibility for shareholder purposes or technological reasons or whatever their rationale might be. But it really just will depend on the specific circumstance and the specific vendors. But I think overall, OTs are more attractive because we do have more flexibility rather than the bureaucracy that can come with a FAR-based contract. Rick? One of the issues, um, if you're going to practice, especially for, for an attorney, if you're going to practice in the OT area, one, you need to know the statutes. It's the statute itself, not regulation. And in addition to knowing the statute in its form today, you probably also have to go back and understand the original form of the statute and what changes over time took place. Today, for the prototype authority, 2371B, we have, uh, it, it's available to enhance the effectiveness of military personnel and then their systems and so on and so forth. 
the original formulation of the old section 845 was directly relevant to weapons and weapon systems. We had two statutes. We had one statute, 2371, the science and technology statute, which was premeditatedly dual use and wanted to be involved in that outreach uh, of the non-traditional community. And we had another statute, the prototype statute, which was directly aimed at major defense contractors and the kind of people that provide weapons and weapon systems to the Department of Defense. That clear dichotomy changed in 2000 when sub, what is now subsection D of 2371B was enacted, which get, gave criteria. And that subsection D, most people, people say, well, the purpose of the prototype authority, as well as the S&T authority, is outreach to the non-traditional community. If you go back and you look at the legislative history of that, what you will find that subsection D was supposed to do was yes, outreach to the non-traditional community, but second prong, increase the efficiency of traditional defense contractors. How do you do that? You encourage them to enter into uh, non-traditional business structures and relationships, and you have that approved by the senior procurement executive. That fourth element of subsection D basically is never used. Nobody has really pushed to have the major defense contractors innovate in their business practices. And I mean, as long ago as the 90s, we had the Defense Science Board saying there are entire segments of the defense industry that could be operated on a commercial basis. We have section 10 USC 2501B that, that says, in order to enhance the national security industrial base, we don't want people to be, we don't want companies to be totally dependent on the Department of Defense. We would want companies that have a foot in each area, in defense and in non-defense. If there's a drawdown in the defense budget, we don't want all of our contractors to go out of business. We don't want all of them to consolidate. We want to be able to, 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 to deal with folks who are both on the cutting edge of commercial technology and also supply uh, technology goods and services to the federal government. And that vision has not been effectuated by the Department of Defense. Uh, j just for a moment, I want to go in a slightly different direction. And I like the fact that Rick just talked about the fact that we start with the statute, right, with the OTs, which reminds us, particularly as attorneys, and I'm assuming that most of the folks in this particular program are law students or attorneys, but knowledge is power, okay? At the end of the day, our stock and trade is giving advice based on the rules. This is what Congress said. This is what the regulator said. This is what the policy guidance said. These are the lessons learned from the courts and the administrative tribunals. That's what we get paid to do most of the time. Now, obviously, as customer-oriented attorneys, we also want to ensure that the agency gets the goods and services that they need so that they can govern and achieve agency missions. But we were trained to give advice within this rubric of, what did Congress say? What do the regulations say? And on and on and on. Okay. So a moment ago, I mentioned the term risk, risk avoidance. We know that an entire generation and maybe the history of contracting officers is their unduly risk of risk of their, 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 un, their inclination is to avoid risk rather than take chances. Not a good thing, but it is what it is. We know they don't want to get in trouble. We know that the compliance movement has exploded in our professional lifetime. Dean Tillotman teaches our class in anti-corruption and compliance. When I got my LLM at GW, there was no such class. We didn't do that, okay? Dramatically changed, massive growth industry. And again, let's keep in mind that the general counsel of the largest defense contractor on the planet had prior experience as the vice president of compliance for Lockheed Martin, okay? So this is a big deal in our industry, okay? So if we train attorneys and contracting officers in 1102s, learn the FAR, right? This is how you get your DAWIA 123 certification or whatever it is. Okay. In addition, we have a familiar oversight regime. GAO, we've got bid process and we've got investigations based on the laws and the regulations. We've got IGs and auditors. 
The auditors are a great example. What does a defense auditor use as his or her rule book? The DCAM, the Defense Contract Audit Agency Contract Audit Manual, which is all about how do I do oversight based on a FAR or DAR or DFARS based contract? Okay, so in this world that we live in now, how do we answer the harbingers of doom? Okay, so if the attorney in the room who isn't in this call because they don't like innovation says, we have rules for a reason, okay? The number one goal is to protect the taxpayer. Avoiding fraud, waste, and abuse is more important than actually achieving government missions. They don't really say that, okay? But we have GAO protests to keep government officials in line so that they follow the rules. We have auditors who do close out audits to ensure that contractors do everything they promise to do. The anecdotal history of the False Claims Act and the key TAM statute is that every existing loophole will eventually be exploited. Okay, so now we say, yeah, we have a statute, we have a guide, but we don't really have so many rules. How do we manage the risk and how do we convince those who fear this innovation to take the plunge? I'll start with you, Rick. Um, I had a session somewhat similar to this on Tuesday with some, uh, some NASA folks that are supposed to be involved in transformation. Um, and one of the questions that came up is, what about checks and balances? And my answer was critical thinking, that you really need a workforce that is educated and that, and that can assess risk and can um, see the benefit of forging partnership relationships and, and fa fairness is not just an issue of avoiding unfairness, it's, 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 it's a way of making yourself an appealing uh, partner in this uh, relationship that you're going to develop with, uh, with industry. Um, look for, uh, you know, cost accounting standards. Well, what if, what if instead of costs, I start thinking about value and I look at a commercial company that wants to be in business, that wants to provide a product, that wants to, over time, upgrade the product and is willing to spend money to do it. Why wouldn't I wanna work with that company where they share some of the development costs, maybe I'll contribute as a government agency, but for up, then they wanna upgrade the product. When the product gets upgraded, I get to purchase the upgraded product without having invested uh, additional funds in. There's opportunities here that transcends the high hey, hey, Rick, 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 you, we, we just had a, that the government. Rick, just cycle back a second. You had a little bit of a glitch there. So just go back mentally. If you can go back 30 seconds, we lost you there. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'm, I was talking about the opportunity to partner with, with companies that have their own interest in advancing the technology, bringing out new uh, products in the future that the government doesn't necessarily grading it for its own purposes. And so we can transcend this, all these checkers and uh, cost accounting standards and all these other things by looking at at value, the potential value to the government of dealing with this kind of a partner, focusing on price. And uh, as, as Hallie knows, I'm a great advocate of payable muscles that wow. rather hey. than cost accounting standards, rather than cost reimbursement, uh, determine whether or not the milestone has been met. Very important uh, element, yeah, so, as well as a. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure what's happening, but you you were great for the first half hour, and now all of a sudden we're getting a little bit of in and out there. So, but I think if with your apologies, and you can correct me. The big takeaway that I got for that, that I'd just like to reiterate here, is that one of the fundamental problems 
with how we deal with performance assessment and procurement is we focus on things like purchase price and cost accounting rather than value for money and return on investment. And if we lived in a dramatic world where we could have an intelligent conversation about things like life cycle costs, total cost of ownership, total ownership costs, uh, whether the government actually got money for the investment they made, it might be much more productive than running around chasing process redistribution and allocation issues. But again, we probably can't solve the overlying or underlying flaws in our compliance programs today. But I think these points are really, really important. But in any event, um, Holly, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I also wanted to add education and training. Going back to your initial thought of how do you kind of appease that naysayer in the room show them, teach them. I was part of the Operation Warp Speed or OWS initiative, and we moved quickly to get these vaccines out. Show them these case studies that can work. Don't look at just the risk continuum, but take a look and look at successful implementation of how fast, how thorough, and how beneficial working in these kind of non-traditional environments oh, can, can be. Can I interrupt just for a second, Holly? So yes. one of the things that I love about what you just said is if you were just to start doing a search in terms of procurement and COVID, one of the first things that would pop up is the Rick Bright whistleblower complaint, which actually I've recommended to students because it's got a lot of really good government contracts knowledge in there. And there was plenty of inappropriate behavior. But one of the problems with our field generally is the media will always focus on, write about, publish, and emphasize the stakes. And as an institution, we do a horrible job finding the success stories, highlighting them, putting people on the podium and says, look at the good work this person did. This is a model or a teaching example of the like. So I encourage the folks at DAU to do this. I encourage people like Rick to talk about case studies and examples and write about them. We're always pushing our students to use successful lessons learned to in effect proselytize the kind of innovation that we're looking to. So I apologize for interrupting, but I think it's so important. Uh, one of the things that when Dan Gordon was with our program, what we often heard and talked about with countries around the world is the GAO equivalent outside the United States in many countries, the audit arms not only write negative reports, but some of them write positive reports. Imagine how potent it would be if in addition to the high risk list, the scariest list you can be on any year as a government program manager, right? If in addition to the high risk list, we had the successful events, the innovators, the models, the productive case studies. I mean, there GAO could really give value added, but we don't think that way. That doesn't mean we can't, but as educators and as people who write in the field, I think we have an important role to show people the success stories so they can learn from them. Again, I apologize for interrupting. Back to you, Hallie. No, no worries at all. I mean, I think of it like this. If you go to a restaurant and it's amazing, how likely are you to go on Yelp and write a review versus if you have a terrible experience? As humans, it seems like we're just more likely to, to harp on the negative. But I agree with you. If we, if we can demonstrate the more positive aspects and the benefits that are derived from this process, we'll keep showing other offices that might be hesitant of the benefits of it. So before, before we leave this compliance thing, and I'm going to go back to both of you again on this, I want to add to the equation the whole bid protest phenomenon. Okay? So look. We've all been in this business long enough. Many attorneys appreciate the value of bid protests as a third party oversight mechanism. It's a relatively efficient way to keep government officials in line, get some level of transparency, some review without grinding the whole process to a halt. When your program gets protested, it's a pain in the butt. But statistically, zero programs get protested, right? We award millions of contracts a year and there's a couple thousand protests. But the big ones are in the news and they traumatize the government and they slow things down. It's complicated here because first, OTs aren't FAR-based contracts. 
so the rules aren't as clear. Second, we have a pretty inter interesting slugfest going on right now about where I take my OT protest if I want to. Can I protest that issue that we talked about earlier, FAR versus OT, and how can I protest the process of an OT competition or award? And obviously we're seeing this play out in the federal courts and the Court of Federal Claims. And I think we have a pretty good idea where GAO is going. But the question is, should we be concerned that it's more difficult for a disappointed offeror or someone who's excluded to protest an OT? And is that in the long run worth the candle? Given what we know about how disruptive individual protests are, but the fact that they're also statistically insignificant, might it make more sense to open up the protest game a little bit and then let the government run with it? Or is the nature of the innovative tool so critical that we literally have to hold protests at bay? Really curious to hear your reactions on that. I'll chime in if I may. I mean, the MD helicopters case that went through GAO and then Court of Federal Claims where the district court contemplations were discussed is very interesting. But I think the nature of OTs, the kind of vagueness and purposeful vagueness that's written in the DOD OTA guide is there for a reason. It's not a part six, far part 15, you know, best value trade-off where there's some decisions that we see come out of GAO and COFC that are specific to a process. You know, an entire decision can be decided because a process wasn't followed or documented correctly. This is not that when we're in an OT, when we're speaking OTs, it's purposefully vague. The competition, the source selection, if you will, process is not as nuanced, is not as specific. So I think that as long as we stick with the tenets that are prescribed in overall OT usage, fairness, being equitable, being transparent, I'm not sure we want to open up the aperture for more protests or allow it more because as long as we're documenting, as long as the government is documenting the rationale and we're being reasonable, and that's the standard, be reasonable in the OT guide, OTA guide, then I'm not sure there would be much derived from that, from an unsuccessful offer, because the government and the program folks and the technical evaluators who know what they need should be given leeway to best pick those solutions that fix a government problem. Rick? One of the things uh, that you can do in the OT world is uh, reinvigorate the agency protest. In the agency has interest in uh, as as Hallie was saying, it, in fairness and in having the, the project move forward there's with instability to interact with it. If part of the solicitation process um, is unfair or, or is counterproductive, uh, hey, industry, tell us about it and let us take some corrective action. So I think a vigorous agency um, protest process, if you want to call it that, but a, a, a way to complain uh, on the front end of a project uh, could be helpful for both the agency as, as well as people who are disappointed. On the other hand, boy, we've come a long way since Perkins Steele, the Supreme Court cases. <laughs> well, we've come a long way since Scanwell. So, anyway, so uh, that's that, that's the only thing I have to say. You know, um, more core action is is not needed for OT. So, so I'm going to I'm going to suggest a couple things. Hey, Rick, just as an experiment, why don't you go ahead and turn your camera off and see if we can get some better bandwidth on you with audio only, um, because you're continuing to freeze up on us, and we want to be able to hear you and have you hear us. I also want to mention for the folks who are in the program that Rick's point on agency protests is not only interesting, but particularly timely. As many of you know, our colleague Chris Eukins recently completed 
a study on agency bid protests for the Administrative Conference of the United States. And I think some of that stuff's going to be published in different places over time. But again, a really interesting issue. And I like the idea. I personally think that agencies could do much better with those protest mechanisms, although that's not always as comforting to the private sector as they may like. But I'm watching the clock. And so what I'm going to do now in reverse order is I'm going to turn to both of our panelists for any closing thoughts or takeaways. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and transition from this portion of the open discussion to a more limited one where anybody who's doing work or research in the field will have the opportunity just to engage directly with our two panelists. So Hallie, closing thoughts, takeaways? Sure, yes, uh, follow the rules. Be fair and transparent, be ethical. Ethical act, acting will eliminate most of the risks that we're so concerned with. And if we document our rationale, document what we're doing, that's the best way to be able to defend the honest and ethical treatment of offers if there are any sort of uh, disputes or issues at the end. Um, but yes, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's a really valuable tool. And the more we can train, the more we can educate, the more it's going to be used. And I think we're seeing that with the trends, that of, especially with the, the graph that you showed at the beginning, Steve. And yeah, please read out, reach out to us at DAU if you have any questions as well. We're open door. Rick? I'll, I'm going to take uh, umbrage with the comment another tool in the toolbox, which uh, that this is part of the leadership problem. That's what leadership sees is that OTs are just another tool in the toolbox. They're far light. No, they're not just another tool in the toolbox. They're not even another toolkit. They're a whole hardware store. And nobody's been wandering around the hardware store finding all the capabilities there that this flexible authority could be used the way you can structure uh, agreements. I'm sorry, it's, I just have a little bit of a hang up on the toolkit uh, issue. And, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, I think education is absolutely important. Getting a team together, not having one, you know, you, you don't have to have just one crook You'd have to have you know five crooks in, in order to do something really good. So get smart people together on a team, use critical thinking, make sure you're educated, and the rest will take care of itself. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Okay, hey, I just want to briefly thank the, the two panelists. I thought Hallie and Rick were incredibly informative. I hope people will stick around, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dean Tillotman, because she's in charge and she'll transition us to our next phase in this effort. All right. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to our fantastic speakers and, and duly noted on the hardware store. We will be updating <laughs> our nomenclature. <laughs> um, uh, so for this next phase, I'm going to go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn off um, our, our recording. So uh, thank you again to everyone who joined us. And for those of us watching this on the recording, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to, to watch our program. 